Amen. Well, what a blessing. Amen. Good to have each and every one here today. Right upon us is the uh, Christmas season. All activities have already started taking place and such. And uh, we're moving through. Uh, Luke, we started a year ago with the birth of Christ and uh, the season. We've worked our way now through uh, to chapter number 12. And uh, we see in these chapters that we're looking at here, kind of give you a little bit of a review, that we see that uh, cost of discipleship is, is, is taking place and Jesus is now is teaching. He's been brought up the fact that He is going to be rejected. And of course, we know in, in John chapter 1, the Bible says He came unto His own, and His own received Him not. He came to the Jews, and the Jews rejected Him. They said, we would not have Him as the Messiah. We will not acknowledge Him. He came unto His own, and His own received Him not. But I love the next verse. The next verse says, to as many as received Him. To them gave you the power to become the sons of God. To them gave you the power to become a child of God. To know Christ as your own personal Savior. It's not just enough to have a head knowledge. It takes a heart understanding that 18 inches right there. To trust Him. The Bible says if we will trust the Lord with our head, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart. That God has raised him from the dead. Thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness. And with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For whosoever shall call upon the Lord shall be saved. When you call out and ask God for it. His forgiveness and your acknowledging and understanding that you know that you're a sinner and ask Him, He will save you. Praise God. Though He was rejected, we see that uh, He is preaching about this and teaching His disciples. And He's come to the point and saying, you know, they're not only going to reject me, they're going to reject you as well. And you need to be prepared for this. And by the way, the Bible tells us all those that live godly in Christ Jesus may suffer persecution. No. No. Ah. It doesn't say may. It says shall suffer persecution. If you decide to live for Jesus, if you live out your life, there will be those who will push or persecute you. There will be those who will mock you. There will be those who will ridicule you. You just start living for Jesus and watch what happens to family, to friends, to co-workers, etc., you let your light shine and you'll see what the, uh, the world, the flesh, and the devil will throw at you. But Jesus has prepared us for that. Matter of fact, in chapter 12, He tells us here that we are free from fear. Uh, that we don't have to fear what men can do to us. We talked about free from greed. We don't have to be so materialistic and so holding on to this world. We can have the freedom from, from greed. And then last week, we talked about the freedom from anxiety. The freedom from worry, the uh, the freedom uh, that God gives to us, uh, that is there. And now He moves a little bit different, see, uh, and 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 helped us to understand what freedom was about. And so that we are free in Christ. Now we move to the point of understanding that God wants us to be ready. He brings to us the importance of watching, watchfulness. And is the key word that is here with us today. Notice if you would back in verse number 35. Uh, uh, Let your uh, lords be girt about and your lights burning. And ye yourselves like unto men that wait for their Lord. When their Lord will come from the wedding. And when their Lord cometh and knocketh, they may open unto their Lord sometimes. In a little while. No, that little word there, that big word there, immediately. Immediately. Here we see that there is a command that is given to His disciples that they need to be ready for the Lord's to come again. We were excited and we get excited at Christmas time at His first coming. And we are to be excited that He's coming again. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we again, we love You. And Lord, it would be so foolish for me to just stand here and to talk without the power of the Spirit of God. 
And Lord, I pray for your spirit today to be in our midst, to work with us, to work on us, to work through us. And Father, that we may listen attentively with our hearts and with our ears. And Lord, may we hear you speak to us. And Father, may we who find ourselves slothful, or we who find ourselves lacking, may realize the urgency of this hour in which we live to draw upon us, to examine our hearts, to make sure that each and every day, each and every night as we pillow our head, that we're ready for the Lord to come, that we're living out our Christianity, our salvation before this world, before our family. Lord, help us to be ever understanding and ever present of the vigilance of being ready for the coming of the Lord. Lord, if there are those here that do not know Him, they're not ready for His coming. Father, I pray for their eternal salvation that they would turn and trust Him before it's too late. I ask this in Jesus' name. And the people once again said, Amen. 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 Praise, Praise the Lord. Lord. In the Scriptures that we'll be seeing this morning, we'll, we'll look at what the Lord is telling His disciples during their time, as well as our time, that we need to learn how to wait, to watch, to be ready, to work, and to live responsibility. Live responsive. And being able to understand what it is as a Christian to live out our lives before others because this is what the world needs to see. They don't need to see church entity. They don't need to see what religious people do. They need to see what God's people will do. Uh, we have a lot of folks at the, are in this world that, are, that are, are claiming to be the people of God and yet they live so far from God. And the tragedy is they can be in good churches all across our country and still not living for God. By going to church doesn't really add up to living the life through the week. You can go to church on Sunday, but if on Monday and Tuesday and the rest of the week you're not living your relationship with God, you're missing out. And by the fact, there is a great judgment that's coming your way, which we'll talk about here uh, very, very soon. Now, I want you to notice, he says, uh, 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 let your lords be girded up uh, uh, about and your lamp lights burning. Now, what Jesus is given here is the story of, of the servants of the household and the, the, the lord of the house, the master of the house. He's gone, in this case, he's gone to a wedding. And so he has given instructions, he's given commands to his servants. And the servants are to be busy about whatever their commands were, whatever their tasks were, whatever their jobs were, and that they were, as he says, lorns girded up. Now, the men would wear robes, and they'd be long flowing robes, but when a man was ready for battle, or ready to go out and work, they would take the robe and pull it up and stick it down within the sack and it would kind of make there so that they would be able to move around a lot easy. And so what he is saying is that they needed to be ready for whatever would take place and be ready for the Master coming again. And then he says, let your lights burning. Uh, your lights burning. That's keeping the lamp lit. That's being ready for you do not know when the Lord or the master of the house is going to come back. And you need to be ready for it. You need to be ready at any time that He would come. And so with this thought that, that their lords were to be girded, their lamps burning, and they're ready for it to come, and He says in verse 36, Ye yourselves like the men that wait for their Lord. Now, he's telling his disciples to be ready because the Lord's going to come. He is going to come and we need to be ready whatever we go through. Now, we know that God has taken away the fear and God has taken away the anxiety and God has taken away the greed and God has taken away all of this so that we're looking to Him and depending upon Him and we just need to be ready for Him. He gives this illustration of men that are waiting for their Lord to return that when the Lord returns, He will knock and they will open immediately unto Him. What He is simply saying is, are you ready for the Lord to come? Are you ready for the Lord to come? Are you prayed up? Are you studied up? Is your life living for the Lord Jesus Christ? Are you seeking first the kingdom of God and His righteousness and all the material things and everything that would have for us that God will take care of all of that? We need to be ready for the Lord to come. Now notice the example he says. 
He says, He cometh and knocketh and openeth unto him immediately. Yesterday, I, well, yesterday morning, in my devotion, I was reading about the wicked person who borrows and never pays back. And I had borrowed tools and I took them back. <laughs> Knock it down that wicked person and just that that's the way it went. And, and I went and knocked on their door. And when they came to the door, they opened the door. And, I, and, and later on that night in my devotion, I thought, you know, about death being at the door. I thought, man, what happened if death had been right there waiting for that fellow when he opened the door? I mean, death is going to come when you least it's You don't know when it's going to happen. You say, well, I'm very, very safe. It doesn't matter how safe you are. It doesn't matter how safe you are. You look around, there are those that are walking. And, and, and you know what? People walk at 5 o'clock in the afternoon here with dark clothes on. I don't understand it. I don't understand it whatsoever. But people do that and, 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 and such. It, it's absolutely crazy. People get ran over on that. We do not know when death will come. But it will come. Notice here, the Lord is coming. He will return from the wedding. He will come back. Now this is not death coming, but it is what the Lord Himself is coming. Matter of fact, Jesus said, Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in Me. In My Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. And then Jesus said, I go and prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again to receive you unto Myself. That where I am, there you may be also. And Thomas said, Lord, we know not where thou goest. Now how can we know the way? And Jesus said, I am. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man come to the Father but by me. Did you get that? That he's gone away to prepare a place for you and that he will come again? And when he comes, it's going to be such an immediate way. It's just going to be a surprising way. Uh, he's coming again. Uh, hold your hand here in Luke. And look with me what Luke had to say in Acts. You say Luke had something to say in Acts? Yeah, he, he's the human writer of the book of Acts. The Holy Spirit moved upon uh, Luke as he wrote the book of Acts. And look with me, if you would, in Acts chapter 1. In verse 8, But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. And when Jesus had spoken these things, while they, this was the disciples that were there, while they beheld Jesus, was taken up, and a cloud received Him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as He went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, this same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as ye have seen Him go into heaven. I want you to know, He has gone to heaven, but He's coming again. You know when He's coming? No, you don't. I don't know, you don't know, nobody knows. But He is coming. He is coming again. And notice what He says, there's the command to be ready, to be, to be girded up, to be let your lamp burn, to be shining, to be used of God. And he says that, uh, uh, that, that, that this command, but notice the celebration down in verse number 37. Blessed are those servants whom the Lord, when He cometh, find them watching. Watching. Verily I say unto you that He, He shall gird Himself and make them the servants to sit down to me and will come forth and serve them. There was a little picture of this in the upper room when they took the Passover meal. And before they took the Passover meal, Jesus girded Himself, went around, and washed the disciples' feet. And washed the disciples' feet. That was a little picture. But I want you to know there's a grand and glorious picture. You know, when, when we take communion, we have an empty chair with us up there. And that empty chair represents the Lord Jesus Christ. Because Jesus said, I'll not take it with you until I take it with you in my Father's kingdom. And that's going to be the day that when we'll be with Him 
And when we have been called away to be with the Lord, and what a great and glorious day that will be. A great celebration. Matthew says that Christ is going to come as lightning. He's going to be quick. And He's coming. And what a celebration it will be. And He says there in verse number 38, And when He shall come in the second watch, or the come in the third watch, and find them so. Blessed are those servants. Blessed are those servants that are what? That are anticipating Him to come. That are ready for Him to come. I've talked to a lot of folks at the door. And i talked to folks who believe that they can lose their salvation. And they say, you know, the reason why I live for God like this is because I'm afraid I lose it. And that's why I live the clean Christian life is because I don't want to lose my salvation. Well, I want you to know that I want to live a clean Christian life and a life that's going to exemplify the Lord, not because I'm afraid I'm going to lose my salvation, but I know that He's coming soon. I know that He's coming soon. You're going to find me in the house of God when the doors are open. Why? Because I know He's coming soon. You're going to find me trying to be the very best Christian that I can be. And even though I'm poor at it in my own flesh, praise God that greater is He that is in me than he that is in this world. That He is coming and He's coming very, very, very soon. Amen. As a young person in May 1969, for the very first time, I stepped into pulpit to preach. This is 1969, folks. I walked up to the pulpit. There was two of us supposed to preach on a Wednesday night. Erwin didn't show up. I had it all myself. I walked up to the pulpit and I went, Hear ye, hear ye. Order in the courtroom. He come the judge. He come the judge. He come the judge. Now I know some of you folks aren't going to get that. But that was the time when Roland Martin laughed and they were talking about He come the judge. And the first message I ever preached was on the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. His second coming. And I want you to know that in 1969 as well as in 2019, I believe that Jesus is coming again. And He's coming very, very soon. I don't know, but He is coming. And I know that He's coming in the air. Because he, the disciples were told by the angels that this same Jesus which is taken up from him shall so come in like manner. He's coming again. Oh, let me tell you something. Look at verse number 39. He says, And this know, that if the good men of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not suffered his house to be broken through. Let me tell you something. If you've ever had your house broken into, <laughs> uh, and you weren't prepared for it. We came home from one time and all of a sudden I realized the carport door was open. It wasn't where we lived here. It was an amateur. Carport door was open. I thought, oh, that wasn't open when we left. It was locked. Well, we walked in, went up to our bedroom and the, the bed had been tossed over. All the drawers had been pulled out. And If you've ever been violated by somebody breaking into your house, you know how we felt. It was a terrible, terrible feeling. You know, if I'd known... If I had known those guys would have come in, I would have been waiting there with a baseball bat. <laughs> Do you know what? I had no idea that that was going to happen. And you know it's going to be like a thief in the night. Here he says, very simply, this know, this understand, this have a point of knowledge, that if the good men of the house had known uh, what hour the thief would come, he would have watched not have suffered his house to be broken through. Let me tell you something. Jesus is going to come as lightning. He's going to come as a thief in the night. Not when. Well, you know, people say, well, you know, we, we, we can't know that, uh, the day or the hour, you know, the seasons that are there and stuff. I'm not for sure when the Lord's going to come, but I do know one thing. He is going to come. And, and with the command in verse 35 and 36, He said, be ready for His coming. And now with the celebration, we see that with preparedness, that we are prepared that He will appear and it will be great joy for us to be ready for when He comes. Because He is going to come. And, and what a blessing that will be. Uh, notice, if you would, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians. You go to the writings of Paul and you pass there the... Philippians and Colossians, you come to 1 Thessalonians, 
Notice with me in chapter 5, and we're going to pick up in verse number 2. Well, let's go to verse 1. But of the times and season, brethren, I have no need to write unto you. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. When they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction come upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. But ye, brethren, he's talking to you and I, the readiness that we need to be prepared. But ye, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. Now listen, he's talking to Christian people here. Ye are the children of light and the children of day, and we are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. Let us watch and be serious-minded about this. That soberness is one of being serious-minded. People aren't serious about the Lord coming back. Now, I make plans. I made plans for Christmas. I made plans for the New Year's. I've got plans there. But let me tell you something. Any of those plans can be disrupted by the coming of the Lord. Amen? Amen. We have to live our lives. We have to make plans. We have to have goals. We have to have desires. We go forward with this. We understand this. But we also know that the Lord can come at any, any time. And none of the things that I have planned. Now, I know. I remember. Believe it or not, I remember as a teenager, oh, I'll never, never get married. The Lord's going to come back before I get married. Hey, guess what? I got married. Uh, uh, oh, we'll never have kids. The Lord's going to come back before we... Hey, we have kids. Uh, uh, Lord, but, but, you know, you, you get to think of it. And I do, I believe that we ought to think that way, that the Lord could come back. But we also need to prepare to live each and every day for Him. As we look for Him, He said, Blessed are those whom the Lord, when He comes, find watching. In verse number 37, shall find watching. Are you watching? Are you anticipating the Lord to come? Now, right past Thessalonians, if you were there, and if you're still there, go to Titus. Right past Thessalonians, you come to 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, and then Paul is writing to Titus. And he says in Titus chapter number 2, Titus chapter number 2. Notice what he says in verse number 11. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. Now notice what the grace of God will do. Teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. You say, preacher, how are we ought to live? Right there it tells us. We are to live uh, soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. But I like verse 13. Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our of the great God and of our Savior, Jesus Christ. We all have that blessed hope. We have that blessed anticipation that Jesus is coming again. And we need to live believing that He's come and that we live soberly, serious-minded, righteously, doing the right thing, Godly, being a godly individual, having the influence of God upon our life. Oh, let me tell you something. You go back to 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. Notice here in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. Verse number 7. So that ye were in samples to all that believe in Macedonia and Achaia. Now the church at Thessalonica, they were a godly example. Now notice what happened. For from you sounded out the word of the Lord not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place your faith to Godward is spread abroad so that we need not speak anything. That should be your testimony. Your testimony as a Christian living soberly, righteously, and godly should be spread abroad. But notice verse number 9. For they themselves show us how that what manner of entering in we had unto you, how ye turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. Notice what he is saying to the church at Thessalonica. You people there. You were serving dumb idols. Idols that had eyes but could not see. They had ears but they could not hear. They had lips but they could not speak. They had hands but they could not help. He said here, very simply, how you turn 
to God from idols to serve the living and true God. Notice what he says, and to wait. To wait for His Son from heaven, whom He had raised from the dead, even Jesus, which deliver us from the wrath to come. Hallelujah. Are you waiting for the Lord to come? Are you living righteously and godly in this world? God wants us to live this way. He exhorts us to, to live this way for Him. We need to be ready. Verse number 40. Ready to be. Be ye therefore ready also. For the Son of Man cometh at an hour when you think not. So Jesus said, you know what? My disciples that are here, you need to gird up your horns, be able to move about, be able to serve, be able to work. You need to let your light shine. You need to be a beacon for the Lord. And, and, and He gives an example of a man coming. He said, you just need to be ready. He said, be therefore ready also for the Son of Man cometh at an hour when you think not. Oh, let me tell you that that coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, to be ready, the readiness consists of having your lords girt about and your lamps lit. The, the girding and the burning that speaks of teaching and testimony and, and, and letting your light shine. I mean, we, we need to have the teaching. We need to have the testimony. Even today, more so, because even amongst Christian people, and I say this kindly, even amongst Christian people, there are those who are denying the coming of the Lord. There are those who are talking about, you know, He's putting it off. Or we're not, you, you can't talk about, uh, some preachers tell me that, they, that if they preach on the second coming, that it offends people in their church because they don't want, God says, be ready. Be ready for His coming because He is coming. So, And He gives us a command. And now he, he, he gives us a celebration of this that we're good about with truth and we're able to let our light shine because of the work of the Holy Spirit in us. But we see the faithfulness down in verse number 41. Then Peter said unto Jesus, Lord, speakest thou this parable unto us or even unto all? Now, Peter is asking the question, are you speaking the parable that we just heard about this man coming back from the wedding and his servants being ready? Are you speaking to us as the disciples? Or is that for everybody? I want you to notice the answer. Jesus didn't give one. <laughs> he didn't give an answer here. You know why He didn't give an answer here? Because it is applicable, applicable ability to those that are in leadership and those that are everybody. Everybody. Yes, those in leadership have responsibility. Yes, those in fellowship have responsibility as well. And he deals with the faithfulness that are there. All the servants of Christ are the stewards of the mysteries of God. And we must all give an account to God. The Bible says that all must appear before the judgment seat of God. That everyone may receive the things that He's done, whether it's good or bad. We all want to serve Him. We all want to decide to say, yes, I will go with the Lord. I will serve Him. We all want to hear those words, well done, thou good and faithful servant. We all should have a desire to be God honoring, Christ honoring in our lives. Notice what the Lord said in verse 42. And the Lord said, Who then is that faithful and wise steward, whom his Lord shall make him ruler over his household to give them their portion of meat in due season? Blessed is that servant, whom the Lord, his Lord, when he cometh, finding him so doing. So Jesus ties these two parables together. He has a second parable here. And, and, and Peter is asking, Is this for leadership or is this for fellowship? And he begins to bring out the fact that the Lord is going to appoint stewards, those that want to be in charge of the household, those that are in leadership. And he said, Blessed is that servant whom the Lord, when he cometh, uh, so find, or shall find so doing. In other words, whether we are in pastoral leadership or we're in lay people, you, you have family, you're in leadership. If you have children, you're in leadership. If you're a husband, you're in leadership. If we look around, we see the responsibility. Yes, it is for all of us to understand this, that we must give an account to God. And notice what he says, blessed, happy, excited is that servant whom his Lord, when he cometh, 
shall find him so doing. You know what God wants to find you doing? You know what God wants to find all of us doing? Living soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. And by the way, we're not going to live godly, and we're not going to live soberly, and we're not... We're not going to be able to live righteously if we're allowing the world to influence us so much, so much. You see, we're in the world, but we're not to be of the world. When I was a kid, my brother had a bass boat. Oh, when I was a kid, kid, we would go up to the lake, and my dad, I'd stand on shore. My dad had take a rod and reel and said, "Now, son, throw it way out there," and I'd take it and I'd. Throw it way out there and watch the bobber of the cork and man, really need to get a nice bass or something, a crocodile or something, and pull it in, you know. But as a little kid, dad would say, All right, throw it way out there and, and, and pull it in. When I got to be a teenager, my brother had a bass boat. We'd get in the bass boat, we'd zoom around the lake, and we'd come up about 30, 40 feet off the lake, and he'd say, Now, Jeff, throw it as close as you can to the shore. Throw it as close as you can to the shore. And I'd chug that little chugger on there and the bass would get that thing. Oh boy, that did. But it was strange. As a kid, Dad said, throw it as far as you can out there. As a, he said, throw it as close as you can out there. Close to the shore. But I said that to say this. What if I was in my brother's boat and he's got a coffee can there and I take that coffee can and I start reaching into the lake and pour water into the boat. He'd say, Jeffrey Neal, what are you doing? He says that can is to take the water out of the boat and put it in the lake. Not take it out of the lake and put it in. He says, we got to get the water out of the boat. You know what? We need to realize that we are in the world, but the world is not to be in us. We are in the world because Christ has put us here. Why? Because we are to reach people for the love of God. We're to reach people and love people and have a burden people for people. And so we're in the world, but we're not to be filled with the world. Matter of fact, when we begin to get filled with the world, we begin to sink. And we're not living soberly. We're not living righteously. We're not living godly. And so he tells us that we need to be this way. And he said, Blessed is that servant whom the Lord uh, cometh so fine, uh, uh, shall find so doing. Doing that, the faithfulness of God's people. He says, Of the truth, I tell you, I say unto you, that he will make him ruler over all that he hath. Well, let me tell you something. God will bless you. And you decide to say, This is what I want, as the Lord is coming back very, very soon. And I want to be ready for His coming. I want to be lifting up my voice. I want to be that. So doing. Not just the intentions of doing. Not just the hopes of doing. Not just the wishes of doing. Not just the feelings of doing. Not just the profession with our mouths of doing. But putting it into practice and doing that which we are supposed to be doing. And then He moves on. And he says down in verse 45, he deals with the faithlessness. He dealt with the faithfulness in verse number 41 through 44. Now he's dealing with faithlessness. Those with less faith. He says in verse 45, but if that servant say in his heart, now notice where it's at. It's in his heart. It's in the heart. I myself have been in places where my heart has been right with God and in tune with God and excited about God. But then something slowly begins to move in my heart and my life and pretty soon in my heart, I'm not there. It's, it's a heart matter. We have to keep our hearts tender for God. This is why we need to confess our sins. This is why we need to examine ourselves. The Bible over and over says examine yourself you're in the faith, that you're in the Lord. Examine. Keep checking your heart. He says in his heart, My Lord delayeth his coming, and shall begin to beat men, servants, and maidens, and to eat, and to drink, and be drunken. Oh, let me tell you something. This guy said, you know what? He's not coming, so I tell you what, I'm the boss right here. I'm in charge. Boy, he starts bossing people around and smacking people upside the head. 
going in there and drinking up the drinks and stuff like that. You say, well, Christians wouldn't do that. Oh. Oh. Uh, you know, as a, as a safe person, I am as capable of doing anything as an unsafe person. As a saved person, I am as capable of doing anything that an unsaved person can do. And so are you. If you think that you're not that way, you need to really examine. Really examine. Notice what he says, that he, he, he began to be drink. In verse 46, the Lord of that servant will come in a day when he looked not for him, and in an hour uh, he is not aware, and will cut him asunder, and will appoint him uh, his portion with the unbelievers. And that servant which knew not his Lord, which excuse me, and that servant which knew his Lord's will, and prepared not himself, neither did according to his will, shall be beaten with many stripes. But he that knew not and didn't uh, commit uh, things worthy of the stripes shall be beaten with few stripes. For unto whomsoever much is given, of him much is required. To whom man committeth much, to, of him they will ask the more. Now, now, notice the unfaithfulness of this guy. He begins to, to, to not realize that the, his master was coming. I was senior in high school. I had a paper route. Drove a 66 Ford Mustang. And we had a missionary come, missionary to the Philippines, by the uh, name of Bob Hughes. And uh, he came, he had two daughters with him, him and his wife, two daughters. And our teenagers were going out Sunday night after church, we were going to go to the Tiki House. We always went to different places, and the Tiki, tiki House was a place for hamburgers and stuff. And so uh, the preacher said, uh, I, I said, Jeff, would you like to have uh, the Hughes' daughter, Cindy, and I can't remember the other daughter's name, would, would you like to give them a ride to the Tiki House? And I said, oh, I sure would. I mean, these two teenage daughters, and I'm a teenage guy, who would, you know? And I lived kitty catty corner from the church. So I said, I just got to go get my car. So man, I ran out the door, went to, now I had a paper wrap. And my car looked like I lived in it. It was a mess. It was an act. Boy, and I was grabbing the wire and the ends of the papers and trying to straighten it up, stuffing it into the trunk and getting the cups and the peanuts and everything on and cleaning up my car, getting it all ready. Boy, I got my car ready. I got back down to the church and I walked in and I was following. I, I said, I'm, I'm ready. And they said, well, they rode with Steve. I said, what? Steve was, had his car here. He was ready to go and Steve took it. Steve took them. You know why he took them? He had a clean car. I had to clean, clean mine up. I want you to know, when the Lord comes again, we're not going to have time to say, oh, I've got to clean this up. i got to take care of this. We need to be ready now. We need to be ready now. My Lord delayeth his coming. The Lord, the, that servant, will come in a day when he looketh not for him. Verse 46. And in an hour when he is not aware, and will cut him asunder and appoint him portions with the unbelievers. And that servant knew... Now notice verse 47. And that servant which knew the Lord's will, and prepared not himself, neither did according to his will, will be beaten with many stripes. This deals with our accountability. Limited knowledge will bring limited punishment. Full knowledge will bring full punishment. We need to understand that what he is talking about here is the things that we know that we are to be doing. We know the command of God, what he has for us. We know what well, notice what he says, the will of God. Verse 47. That servant which knew the will, the Lord's will, and prepared not himself. Neither did according to the will of the Lord will be beaten with many stripes. You know, you, you, you have a real danger by coming to a church like this. Because you're going to hear the truth. You're going to hear the word of God, and you're going to be accountable to God for that. We're going to have to give an account for that. 
The church this morning where the pastor is standing up and talking about hiking up in the highlanders and smelling the flowers and the beauty of God and such, those people aren't going to be nearly as accountable to God as you. Because you hear the Word of God preaching. And I don't say we're the only church. There are churches across this country and everything that, that preaches the Bible. They just want to let you know. But here, if, if you hear the Gospel over and over and over and over and over again and do not respond to it, Notice it's going to be many stripes. And now notice the verse 48. But he that knew not the Lord's will and did not commit such things worthy of stripes shall be beaten with few stripes. Now it's like this. I don't have time to go into it all, but I believe that there are degrees in hell just as there are degrees in heaven. The degrees in heaven is everything that you and I do in the Spirit of God, everything we do for God and God does through us, when we stand before God, it's all going to be burned away and wood, hay, and stubble will be gone. Silver, gold, and precious stone will be left. And that's the rewards that we will have in heaven. And some of us will have more, some of us will have less, but there will be degrees when we get to heaven. And I believe hell is the same way. I believe those people who never hear a clear presentation of the Gospel of Jesus Christ Hell will not be as horrible as for that person who heard the gospel and heard the gospel and heard the gospel and heard the gospel and never responded and trusted Christ as their Savior. There's a whole message I have for preaching. I don't have time today. But it is understandable right here through Scripture. And it's not just my belief. There are many that looks at this and understand. Those with many stripes have an accountability those with few stripes will, who, who never heard. You say, well, what about the heathen? What about the heathen in foreign countries that never heard the gospel? Where do they die? They die and they go to hell. Because there's only one way to God, and that's through Jesus Christ. And if they never hear of Him, then they die and go to hell. They're accountable to God. That's why we give our faith promise. That's why we pray for our missionaries and send people out. That's why we put gospel tracts out here. It's so that people can hear and so that they can respond to the gospel. Verse 48, For unto whomsoever much is given of him shall much be required. And to whom men have committed much of him they will ask the more. Responsibility is measured by opportunity. You have an opportunity to serve God. You're responsible for that. You have an opportunity for Sunday night. You have an opportunity for Thursday night. You have an opportunity to serve God. You have an opportunity that God gives you to let your light shine, to be girded up, to live soberly, righteously, godly. God gives you those opportunities. And when God gives you, you are now have a requirement. You are now have a responsibility. Because we will have to give an account to God for all of this. Now, to hear the gospel and to respond to it, God gives us His law. His law. Now, we know what the law of God is. We call them the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments are given to us as the law of God. And when he says that there is no other God before him, and not to take the Lord's name in vain, and not to make idols, it is our relationship with him. He gives us a law on how we're to treat our parents. We're to honor our parents. He tells us that we're not to kill. Uh, we're not to steal. We're not to lie. We're not to covet. We're not to commit adultery. These are things that God has. But God has given us the law that is there to help us to understand. But the problem is that we have all offended God in that law. We've all offended God. Have you ever told a lie? God says, Thou shalt not lie. Bear false witness. Have you ever coveted after something that belonged to somebody else? You say, Preacher, I've never committed adultery. You know the Bible says that when we look upon a woman and have lust in our heart, we've committed adultery with her right then and there. 
Now, I've never killed anybody. Have you ever had hatred in your heart that you would hate somebody? That's killing. You see, there is a law, and we've offended that law. We've broken that law. And because we're broken that law, there is a verdict. There is a verdict. The wages of sin is death. Because we have sinned and broken God's law, we now have a verdict. And that's death separated from God in a place called hell. The gift of God is eternal life with God. Death is separated from God. And we've all offended God. But I want you to know that you see God's love right there. And with God's love, He's given a way of escape. We've broken the law of God. We've offended God. There's a verdict for that. That we are now separated from God in a place called hell. But Christ died for us. That He would save us in a way to escape. Hebrews says, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? God has given that salvation through Jesus Christ. That you can trust Him today. God loves you. He cares for you. You have offended God. And there is a verdict that one day we will all stand before God, but have you escaped by trusting Christ as your Savior? I'm so glad that as a 10-year-old boy, I put my faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Now, I've not lived a perfect life, neither of you, but I do know through the Word of God and through the work of the Holy Spirit that I believe that He is coming. Look this way just one second. He is going to come in the air and we're going to be raptured. We're going to be caught away to be with the Lord and so shall we ever be with the Lord. And there I believe that when we go to heaven we'll have the judgment seat of Christ that we'll be judged and there for not for our sins my sins were judged on Calvary's cross. Your sins were judged on Calvary's cross because Jesus paid it all. When we stand before Jesus as our judge, it's the Bema seat. It's for those good works. It's for those service that we've done for Him. Not wood, hay, and stubble, but silver, gold, and precious stone. When we stand there, on earth is going to be tribulation. And seven years later on earthly time, the Lord Himself shall come all the way to the earth and He's going to set up His millennial kingdom. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Oh, He is coming. He's going to come as a thief in the night. I don't know when He's coming. But I want to be ready. First of all, if you've never accepted Christ, know that God loves you. You have broken the law of God. You have offended a holy God. There is a verdict for that. And there's also a way of escape. Trust Christ as your Savior. And then as a Christian, let me tell you something. We need to be ready. When we know, when we take in and understand, we need to say, Lord, help me be serious. Serious-minded, sober-minded. And understand this. Help me to be righteous. Not my righteousness, but the righteousness of Jesus Christ. That it is Him through me enabling me to do the right things. And God will. Let us just walk through the Lord. Dr. Whitefield, the old preacher, every night when he went to bed, he'd say, Dear Lord, I pray that not even a club is out of place. That everything's right between me and my Savior. Because you could come tonight. You could come tonight. You could come tonight. Are you ready? Our gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we love you. And we thank you for your love for us. Lord, I just pray that we as your children, we as your people would take seriously the coming of the Lord. You know He came the first time and we celebrate it even this time of the year. But Father, may you find us watching, waiting, working, doing that which is expected of us to do, the will of God. Lord, help us not to get sidetracked or distracted. Help us not to get carried away with every wind of doctrine. Father, help us, Lord, to understand what You have provided for us and that our walk with You is so important. I pray for these teenagers. I pray for the men and the ladies. I ask, Father, for myself. Lord, that we would all be ready for the coming.
coming of the Lord. Lord, that our lives be demonstrated that we believe He's coming soon. Help us, Lord, Father, in Christ's name. As our heads are bowed and eyes are closed, if you've never trusted Christ, you don't know for sure that when you die that you'd go to heaven. But today is the day that you'd like to settle. Today is the day you'd like to sit down with an open Bible and talk about your eternal destiny. In a few moments, the pianist is going to play. When she begins to play, I want to invite you to come and have a word of prayer with me. After the service, we'll sit down, take all the time that we need. If you can't do it today, we'll sit down this week. We'll talk about everything we need so that you can know your relationship with God is real. And as a believer, as the pianist comes, she begins to play, ask yourself, examine your heart. Are you ready for the Lord to come? Because notice in the Scripture, the servant in his heart. What are we saying? What are we doing with our heart? Are we lifting it up to the Lord? Are we drawing it into ourselves with selfishness? My time, my talent, my treasures, mine, mine. Or are we willing to say, thank you, Lord, for giving me these things. I want to be a good steward of these and use them for His honor and Lord and praise. What God speaks to you about, make that surrender to Him. If you want to pray with me, I'll give you that opportunity to come and pray with me. Let's stand with our heads bowed and eyes closed.